Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Rahul Madhim Sethi. I uh, lead the venues and geo team at Foursquare in New York City. Uh, today, I will be talking a bit about some of the work that we did on the geo stack at Foursquare in this past year, specifically the parts of it that we have already given back or are in the process of giving back to the open source community. Uh, this talk ties together several disparate projects and uh, the common theme which, which is about iteration kind of revealed itself to me uh, in a moment of either great clarity or great desperation three days before the proposal for this talk was due. Uh, now that I see that, see that common theme though, I, I sincerely believe it was that thread that ran through all of our work and as much as this talk is presented in the hope that uh, you'll find the work that we did cool, we, we actually honestly intended to be a study in how the business needs of a, uh, of a commercial organization can drive rapid iteration on, a, uh, on an open source geo project. Uh, before I begin though, a very quick shout out to David Blackman, without whom there'd be none of this for me to iterate on. Uh, David wrote the Two Fishes Geocoder, released the Quattro Shapes project and wrote the first version of pretty much all of our geo infrastructure at Foursquare. Uh, he was also my manager through most of this work. He now works at Twitter, but we continue to uh, collaborate on all things Two Fishes. I'll start with a very quick overview of the Foursquare geo stack. Uh, down in the lower left, we have all of our data sources, so GeoNames is our primary gazetteer. We use Natural Earth for uh, additional ranking data. Most of our polygons come from the Quattro Shapes project. Uh, we supplement this with shapes from the US Census Tiger data. We, uh, we license worldwide neighborhood data from Maponix. And uh, as of a few weeks back, we've just kind of started to uh, look into importing Getty's to sort of GeoNames. Uh, on the top left, uh, most visibly, is the Two Fishes geocoder that serves like thousands of queries a second across forward geocodes, reverse geocodes, ID lookups, uh, live traffic at Foursquare. Uh, we also have an offline geocoder that basically serves the same index but powers uh, reverse geocodes and ID lookups in our uh, Hadoop job, our MapReduce jobs, and our Hive queries. Uh, not pictured here primarily because it doesn't have a logo, is a, is a very fast. Uh, in-memory reverse geocode, uh, uh, country and time zone reverse geocoder uh, that we use. And uh, in addition, uh, we use Yahoo, uh, Yahoo's geocode API for some limited worldwide address geocoding and Smarty Streets for some address geocoding and address normalization in the US. That sidewise T or hammer, or gavel or whatever it looks like to you uh, is essentially all of the geo tools and libraries that we use to process, analyze, visualize, manipulate. Uh, whatever the, the source and generated data at any stage of any pipeline at Foursquare. Uh, off on the right for completeness is, is what I like to call our external stack. So on the Foursquare and Swarm apps, uh, we fall back to the devices underlying map stack. So whether that's Google Maps, Apple Maps, Bing Maps, or Nokia here. Uh, and on the web, we, we, we use map boxes, absolutely stunning map tiles. And those in turn are, uh, are powered by OpenStreetMap base map data. Uh, so together, this is everything that the Geo team at Foursquare works on and works with. The rest of this talk is going to talk about Two Fishes. Uh, so Two Fishes is a coarse geocoder, by which I mean that it is concerned with the granularity of places, uh, not so much streets and addresses and street intersections and the like. Uh, so it's a reverse geocoder as well as a forward geocoder. Uh, as a forward geocoder, it is autocomplete capable, and it, it does query splitting, by which I mean it is capable of parsing the what and a where from a query. So pizza New York, you have what pizza and where New York, for instance. It's written in Scala. Our uh, interface definitions are in Thrift. We then code gen that Thrift to Scala using uh, Foursquare's own spindle library. Uh, and the service is built on Finagle, which is uh, from Twitter. Outside of uh, Foursquare, uh, Two Fishes is used at Twitter, it's used at Pinterest, and we continue to see uh, growing interest from a bunch of startups and other fast-moving companies uh, that are committed to OpenGeo. So at Foursquare, Two Fishes serves, like I said, the order of thousands of queries a second, cross forward and reverse, uh, and ID lookups. And the vast majority of that, given the nature of our apps, 
is, is reverse geocodes. Now, geocoding, as you can imagine, is at the very core of, of both the Foursquare and Swarm, uh, Swarm products. And so it follows that any improvements we make to the geocoder help improve the experience of using these products. And similarly, any new direction that the product must take, like it did in 2014 when, when we unbundled Foursquare into Swarm and the new Foursquare, will be partly enabled by a, a faster, better, more capable geocoder. Uh, but this scale is not unique to Foursquare by any means. Uh, thousands of QPS, yes, there are a lot of geocoders that can do that, but not too many that are open source. Uh, that kind of serve the production loads that, that two fishes deployments do. And so if you're a startup or indeed any kind of cash trapped entity uh, that is looking for an open source course geocoder and you know you, you are either unable or unwilling to, to pay Google or Microsoft or Yahoo or Nokia for the use of their geocoding API, uh, chances are that your Google searches will lead you to, to consider two fishes at some point. And with the work that we've done this last year, uh, you don't just get a geocoder that you can deploy to production and throw thousands of queries a second at. You get that. But in addition, uh, you, you, get, you get tools that allow you to measure the quality of your, of your geocoder for your query patterns. You, you get tools that allow you to do the same for performance in your environment against your traffic patterns. In addition, uh, we build tools that allow you to uh, push hot fixes, like high priority data fixes, in minutes and then get back to whatever else you were doing. Uh, and we give you the ability to build indexes fast and frequently on a Hadoop cluster. Uh, like I said earlier, it's important to note that all of this was driven by Foursquare's business needs. It's not so much like our desire to do cool stuff, which, which is a given, but it, it was Foursquare's business needs that drove how this work got prioritized and eventually delivered. Uh, and everyone benefits from that because it's open source. So the first thing I'll be talking about is the autocomplete evaluation framework that we built. Uh, in in mid-2014, after we launched the Swarm product, the whole company was cranking away at the new Foursquare. And, and the Geo team in particular was uh, was concerned with improving the quality of, of two fishes autocomplete. Until that point, we had a monolithic ranker for forward geocoding that we used both for full text geocodes and for autocomplete. Uh, and it kind of conservatively weighted both static ranking signals like population of a place or uh, whether it was some kind of a state or country capital uh, and dynamic ranking signals like the distance from a user location or distance from bounds. And it weighted this in a way that kind of sort of worked for both these rather different purposes. On the evaluation side, we had uh, a rather simple script that replayed a sample of API requests against a baseline and a candidate build and told you what changed uh, for the top result under, uh, under a variety of heads. Now, it didn't, it didn't qualitatively label these changes good or bad, far less meaningly quantify them. Uh, but all it did was tell you for which queries the top result changed in some way. We used to run this tool before we rolled out a new index or any time we made a major code change. And then we'd manually inspect the results and either sign off on them or go back and fix anything that needed fixing. It looked something like this. I said it was basic. That's about as basic as it gets. Uh, and this, this kind of worked. This worked for the old Foursquare where we were one app that was half social, half uh, search and discovery. But with the, with the new focus, uh, it was entirely about search and discovery in, in the Foursquare app specifically. So besides, if you think about it, uh, autocomplete and full text geocode are two very, very different problems. For starters, the queries in our case come from two entirely different places in the product. Uh, and uh, the local intent in one case is much stronger than the other. And even the way that you would measure uh, the quality of the user experience is different in each of these cases. With autocomplete, for instance, it isn't just a question of whether you return the, the right result at number one. It matters how many keystrokes it took you to get there. And further, as you can imagine, with mobile users, uh, it isn't just number one that matters, uh, because a lot of mobile users would probably rather type two characters of a query and hit a visible result at number three or number four than type the additional three or four characters it takes to bring it up to number one. And Quite different from this, uh, this, this 
this tendency to conserve keystrokes is, is a lot less pronounced with web users to the extent that it's virtually absent. I mean, web users are very likely typing at a keyboard with both their hands, uh, and, and their fundamental unit is words, not characters. They would probably much rather type longer to bring the result they want up to number one than reach for the arrow keys or, or even the mouse to select like number three or number four. Right, so uh, all of this was, was our intuition before we embarked on an overhaul of our autocomplete ranking. Uh, and it made little sense to get started on those ranking improvements before we had a way to measure any improvements that would result in user experience uh, in a way that addressed all of these various aspects of the user experience, right? So this is, is, is what we did. We wrote a bunch of uh, map reducers that extracted successful autocomplete sessions from our interaction logs. Now, by a successful autocomplete session, I mean one where a user started to type the name of a place, selected an autocomplete suggestion, and then performed some kind of venue search within that geography. Further, that they got back results that they were happy enough with that they interacted with the results that they got. Now, to clarify that last bit, I think it's, it's useful to, uh, to give you a real-world counterexample of what, what might be an unsuccessful session. And this was a bug that I fixed last year, so I'm quite familiar with it. Uh, take, for instance, a case where a user started to type Alexandria. They meant Alexandria in Egypt, but we returned Alexandria in Virginia. And they wouldn't know it yet because it would just say Alexandria up there. Uh, until they searched, let's say, for restaurants, and then they got back a list of results and something seemed wrong, right? And so at this point, they're more likely to backtrack and maybe try to refine their search or something than to interact with the results. So that's, that was our intuition about what uh, a successful session would be like. And once we had these success successful sessions, we essentially had a truth set, right? And the truth set, I call it a truth set on the basis of the fact that it was, it's a pretty strong signal for that definition of a, success, of a successful session. It's a pretty strong signal that for, for this query coming from a user at this location, this is the desired result, right? And what it allowed us to do is something we could never do before, which was make those qualitative judgment calls about whether a change was good or bad, right? So, so we wrote a tool that, uh, like before, essentially replayed queries against a uh, baseline and candidate build and uh, compared how many keystrokes it took for the desired result to get to each position. And on this basis, we placed individual queries in either regression or progression buckets uh, for each position so that we could tell whether uh, a query had gotten better or gotten worse. And when I say for each position, uh, I, I, I just need you to consider that it's possible that for a particular query, it regressed at number two but got, got better, or progressed at number one or the other way around, right? So in aggregate, what we could do is also uh, to, to give an overall score uh, to a build so that we could tell at a glance that this was a pass or a fail before we drilled into individual queries. Uh, best of all, we plotted all of this on a map, which is kind of the point of being a geo team, I guess, uh, using both the user's current location and the location that they were searching for. And what this allowed us to do was, was to see broader geographic patterns uh, to the change, right? Uh, it, it allowed us to make observations like, okay, this is a net improvement globally, but something's up with queries originating from Indonesia, right? What's the deal with that? Or uh, all queries for London, regardless of where in the world they originated from, regressed, right? So that's something if you just saw a flat list of, of changes, you wouldn't be able to, uh, to intuit. Uh, another thing that we did is we extracted separate mobile and web sessions so that we could use different metrics for each. For instance, we returned five autocomplete suggestions uh, in our mobile apps, but only three uh, on web. So it makes sense that you need different metrics for them. Uh, another thing, and this seems kind of natural, is that users on the web usually search farther away from their current location. Uh, and that, that current location is a lot less precise to begin with, given, given that it's often derived from like GYP lookups or something. Uh, another thing that we did is we, we, we logged the distance from the user to, the, uh, to their desired result uh, with the idea that we could then feed back these distances as thresholds for the ranker. Uh, the end result is a tool that looks something like this. So off on the left, you have like high level uh, scores for the candidate versus the baseline. And on the right, there's a map showing you whatever you select from here, individual regression or progression buckets. Uh, there's also a list that you can't see in the uh, screenshot. And what you can do then is drill down into individual queries and replay them one character at a time to see what the user saw, right? And in red here, you see the desired result. 
And here you see why this was a regression because it rose to the top faster in the, in the baseline than it did in the uh, candidate pair. Uh, this tool allowed us to rapidly iterate on autocomplete ranking. We essentially, uh, uh, we uh, abstracted away all of the individual ranking signals and then built multiple rankers that combined and weighted them differently for different purposes, unlike the single ranker that we had earlier. So we had one global ranker that only looked at static importance, a local ranker that only cared about distance, something that only returned in-country results. And you know, it was, it was fairly finessed. There were a lot of things we tried. Uh, in the process, we ended up defining something called autocomplete bias, which is now an API parameter you can pass to two fishes for autocomplete queries. Uh, you can set it to local or global or balanced. Uh, and that influences what combination of rankers gets used. So the main autocomplete box in Foursquare uses balanced because that's what makes sense for that use case. But when you suggest an edit to a venue and you want to change its neighborhood or its city, you want to search within the vicinity. So we, so we use the local uh, uh, flag there. Uh, I was planning to talk about how we integrated with Iago, which is from Twitter, uh, the load testing framework from Twitter. Uh, but uh, after we got moved from the developing FOS4G track to the big day to day track, I kind of decided to drop this in favor of spending more time on more relevant stuff to big data, I guess. Uh, so just on the off chance that you came to see this presentation because the bit about load testing in the description caught your eye, I'm going to put this very quick plug in for uh, Twitter's Iago. It, it was great for our purposes. It's still a work in progress. Uh, we are working to integrate it internally. Uh, and once that's done, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll open source it back. The next thing I'd like to talk about is our hotfix infrastructure. Uh, as anyone who's worked with GeoData knows, it's incredibly hard to get right for, for a variety of reasons, beginning with ontology, right? I mean, there isn't that grand unified model that's capable of simultaneously allowing New York's five boroughs to be coterminous with their counties, of which for address purposes only Manhattan is New York NY, or that allows, the, allows London to have 33 administrative subdivisions, of which all but the city of London are boroughs, or that allows Tokyo's 23 special wards to all be cities. Now, while simultaneously allowing all of these to be true, that can also reconcile these varied uh, local administrative hierarchies with people's mental models of them, which is that they're just cities for God's sake, right? Now, I could go on forever, but every major world city, suffice to say, is, is like a corner case that rips at the fabric of some exquisitely crafted data model that was not designed to include it specifically, right? So moving on, uh, something more banal and uh, inevitable like change, right? You have this happen every now and then, cities, states, even countries sometimes change names, redraw their boundaries, and you've got to react to that. Uh, there's geopolitical conflict. Uh, honestly, I'm exhausted just having uttered those words, so I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, then there's human error, right? Human error tends to creep into data entry, data collection. Uh, given that we have community sources like GeoNames, uh, sometimes we have pure malicious edits or edits that were badly informed. Uh, we have programming errors creep into stuff like conflation or any, any other stage of the very complex data pipelines that companies like Foursquare uh, tend to build. So the bottom line is that geodata for casual human consumption is all about opinion. Uh, very often governments and people disagree, locals and tourists disagree, and you want to make things interesting, toss neighborhoods into the mix, and locals and other locals can very vehemently and venomously disagree with each other. Uh, what we're left with is data that's, that's extremely volatile, right? Because you're burdened with the need to reflect a constantly changing truth, if there is such a thing as the truth. And more often, you have to choose between multiple versions of the truth and choose in a way that offends as few people as possible. So what this results in is that at Foursquare, like any other company that serves geodata to like millions of consumers, there's this steady stream of geo truth bugs, as we like to call them. It's interminable and it's, it's extremely disruptive to the productivity and the sanity of the developer who must then go drop everything to fix it. Uh, most of these changes come with a deadline of yesterday. So, you know, when you, when you need to make a change fast, just sticking it in one end of this data pipeline and expecting it to roll out the other fast is not realistic. Uh, 
A particular recent and painful example was two weeks before we uh, released a new Foursquare in July 2014, we suddenly realized that the shape of San Francisco that we were serving included the Farayon Islands about 30 miles west of here. Uh, and what that resulted in was that the map view in the iOS app was zoomed out way too much to be useful. So, of course, I had to drop everything I was doing at the time, which, what was I doing at the time? I was working on other GeoTruth fixes, uh, which were like changes to shapes of neighborhoods in New York and Seattle, if I remember correct. And unrelated to any of this, I was working on indexer improvements. They had nothing to do with the upcoming release, right? And I had to build a new index, which at the time took about 10 hours. But the changes I was working on to the indexer were not really ready for showtime, so this took multiple attempts. Uh, and I had to keep fixing bugs as I went along. Finally, with one day to go before launch, I managed to push this thing into production, an index that had just the fixes that I wanted and no regressions. So, sure, I could look back upon this and say that the lesson to be learned is always work in a feature branch, you idiot, not in master. But that's overkill, and it doesn't get at the bigger problem, right? Besides, we have fixes very often that are not high priority, that can wait. And we batch them up into like our scheduled index updates. And when the index rolls out, we kind of go back and verify that it's been fixed and report back to whoever else reported them. And this is overhead that I can do without. Right, so what it came down to was two things. The first of which is obvious. Of course, we need faster index builds. Uh, there's only so much you can get from vertically scaling the single box on which you build your indexes. The logical next step is to start building our indexes on a Hadoop cluster. But that is a lot of engineering effort, and we've been putting it off for a long time. We got to it. That's the last part of my talk. I'll get to that. But more immediately, we needed a, a super quick editorial process that allowed us to write and deploy uh, hotfixes to production. The goal was to do it in under 30 minutes. Uh, we actually managed to do it in under 15. And this is how it works. Uh, you write up your fixes in Scala. Essentially, you're building up a thrift object using the builder classes that Spindle gives you. Uh, you can do anything you want. You can add new features, delete features, and you can modify existing features to change their names, their geometries, their parents, their attributes, absolutely anything. Now, depending on how complex the hotfix you're making is, this is the part that actually takes the longest time. In practice, it takes about 10 minutes, let's say, if you're making a somewhat uh, involved geometry change. You need to redraw your shapes and regenerate GeoJSON or uh, WKT for them to actually put into this file here. Uh, so this is how it looks. You, you take that Scala definition, you run a script that generates JSON from it. Now, JSON really only so that it's like human readable, human editable. Uh, and then the black box, which will vary based on how exactly you deploy two fishes. But at, at, uh, at Foursquare, we use loco, which, uh, which packages up in versions, code and data artifacts across a production fleet. Uh, the idea is to basically get that JSON, JSON hotfix onto your individual servers into a directory that it has been configured to look for them. And so we use loco for that. It takes about two minutes. Uh, and one important thing is we didn't want just picking up a hotfix to require a full service restart. So we added this uh, private endpoint on the server. We just kind of tickle it, and it refreshes the uh, JSON hotfixes from the configured directory, rebuilds the in-memory data stores that override whatever the main index says. And this takes like a couple of seconds. And so the hotfixes take immediate effect. And then you get back to whatever it was you were doing, right? Now, we, we usually also take the same fix and plug it back into the index so that all subsequent indexes get that fix permanently. Uh, but we're no longer blocked on a 10-hour index build, and that's the important thing. This was about a couple of weeks of engineering effort, which we've already recovered in terms of time that would otherwise have been lost to engineer context switches. Right, uh, And you might ask, how does this help with iteration? It helps primarily by keeping disruptive and annoying data fixes out of the way when you're actually iterating on something else. Right? Uh, so finally, moving on to our uh, uh, Hadoop build, for which we use Scalding. I'll tell you about that in a bit. Uh, like I've mentioned earlier, the, the motivation for this work was obvious. I've been hearing about it from my first day at Foursquare. Uh, it always seemed in the distant future, you know, because it wasn't quite uh, critical to the business yet, but we all knew the time would come very soon that it would be. So given that the hotfix infrastructure was now in place, this was the logical next step. Uh, 
I want to take a moment to clarify how this relates to iteration though because a lot of the context I've already set has to do with reacting to change and sure that's important. Very often uh, there are changes that are just too large scale, right? Like the creation of new countries or states uh, that affect too many features for us to go about hot fixing. A good example of this is when the Scottish independence referendum was happening. I was, I was looking at it very closely because I was like, oh my God, there are going to be like thousands of features whose hierarchies are going to have to change and I'm going to have to hot fix them and I hope I don't have to. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> no, not, well, it turned out all right finally, but. And admittedly, that's, that's, that's a limitation of how geonames works, where every feature stores its entire hierarchy. That's not ideal. If our hierarchies were stored as a graph, for instance, this wouldn't be a problem. You just, you, you take care of one level below and you're set. How I wish it was that way. Regardless, I mean, this is just a thought experiment at this point, because even if the Scottish people had voted for independence, it's not like the new country would have suddenly materialized in a day or something. Right? We would have had time to react to this. Regardless, this is the kind of thing that requires a full index build. It's not what the hotfix infrastructure was designed to solve. So, uh, uh, you know, th there are, a, there's a certain class of changes that, that a faster index build allows you to react to faster, but that's, you know, those are few and far between. So, as much as it is a factor, it wasn't the motivating factor. Rather, it is about keeping up with with far more mundane changes, right? So our, uh, our underlying data sets change very frequently. Geonames changes every minute maybe, right? But uh, we only update our indexes every several weeks. And to us, that's a lost opportunity to be serving the freshest data possible. Uh, so if we had a faster index pipeline, we could be building and pushing indexes daily. And you know, that, that is a, that's a good thing to be able to do. Most importantly though, and this was, this was what finally pushed us over the edge, uh, any time that we've built a new feature or just made any improvement to quality or performance of the geocoder, it hasn't just been server code that's been touched. Very often we've had to change what we index and how. Uh, a relevant example would be uh, when I was working on the autocomplete uh, improvements, uh, I started to pull in this attribute from Natural Earth that told you whether a city is a world city or not. Right now, before I could go back and measure how much of an improvement resulted from that, I would have to rebuild the index. Like I said earlier, that was 10 hours of machine time, good deal more wall clock time in practice. So in late 2014, when we were like evaluating and prioritizing work for the upcoming year, you know, stuff like improving query splitting and maybe finally supporting fuzzy string matching, and overhauling our autocomplete index to have separate local and uh, global indexes. One thing was clear, these were not going to be purely server side changes. Very often, or rather, we would be in the process of iterating on these features, building the index several times and losing 10 hours each time was no longer an option. So the time had come, right? And we built uh, a new indexer using scalding, which I mean, I know I, I'm, I'm assuming most of you know what scalding is, but it's, uh, it's a library, it's a scholar library from Twitter that sits on top of cascading, which in turn is comparable to pig and the like, uh, essentially abstracts away a bunch of low level Hadoop details for those that are particularly, who find it daunting, I guess, I don't know. We specifically use the scalding type safe API, not the fields API, that is a nightmare. Uh, the, the type safe API reads like regular Scala and affects the same data transformations using maps and reduces. So it was great. I mean, I enjoyed working on this. Uh, I've said repeatedly, we have complex data pipelines. This, this figure doesn't do it justice, but this is what happens at a very, very high level. We import and conflate features from multiple sources. We normalize and generate additional names. We have one off fixes, which is where stuff would be plugged in before we had a hot fix infrastructure. Uh, and then we, we ingest polygons from multiple sources. Some of them have already been matched up to features, the others haven't, so we kind of match them on the fly. Uh, and you know, in the single machine indexer case, this all happens in a Mongo data store, so everything's imported into Mongo, all processing happens there. Uh, and we finally spit out a bunch of indexes that are Hadoop map files and uh, H files. So this is relatively straightforward when conceived as a serial flow on one single machine, right? Because you have a central data store that you can query as you please. Not so much the case when you try to parallelize using MapReduce because now all of a sudden you're running all these jobs in parallel, they run independently, they produce their own output and you've got to merge that output. 
you don't have the benefit of a of a central store except you know Hadoop gives you this thing called cached files but they're not really useful for this purpose so what that means is you've got to design your job so that the key value pairs that you emit carry all the all the information that they need with them and this is easier said than done because mappers and reducers don't have a ton of resources right you could kill a mapper or reducer if you if you passed along gigantic shapes with it for instance uh, so this particularly complicated uh, polygon matching that I mentioned earlier, the on-the-fly matching that we do for unmatched polygons, to the extent that it needed an entirely different implementation. Now make no mistake, this stuff is complex enough as it is. We have a spatial index in Mongo on the features that we then query for each unmatched polygon. We query features within the bounds and, uh, you know, do some matching magic, I shall call it for now, because it's, it's too complicated to get into. Uh, but the, the magic essentially honors a multi-tiered feature type preference for what kind of features it can match in the first place. Now, when doing this in the scalding build, this essentially meant having to do a whole lot of S2 covers. Now, I don't think everyone knows what S2 is. S2 is this absolutely brilliant uh, spherical geometry library from Google that is open source. In fact, my manager, my my former manager, David Blackman, who used to work at Google Maps, was instrumental in getting them to open source it after he came to Foursquare. The basic idea is that you project the Earth onto the six faces of a cube and put a quadri on each of those faces. Uh, and the uh, this S2 covering that I'm talking about is essentially a minimal covering of any shape by those quadri cells, right? So you can then use the IDs, which are 64-bit integers, of these cells as a key on which to join, right? So what we did in the scalding build is do an S2 covering of the features, of the polygons that weren't matched, join them, do a lot more magic this time to, uh, to, to choose amongst the best features that, that honored the, uh, the tiered feature type preference that I talked about, right? And even more S2 covers because at the end of our index build, there's this nifty little thing we do where we try and we, we use the reverse geocode index that we have just built to try and find parents of features that do not have parents. And this again required yet more S2 covers and yet more joining and all of that, but it all worked out. Uh, at the end of it all, I mean, I look back upon all of this work fondly and say it was time consuming. It, it was frustrating at times, but it was extremely rewarding. Uh, it simultaneously added complexity to our pipeline and took complexity away. Because at the end of it, I mean, we have, we have a data pipeline that's been truly decomposed into its, into its smallest logical units. Uh, another pleasant but unexpected side effect of this is from staring at all of that indexer code, we, we found inefficiencies where we weren't even looking for them. So the single machine indexer is now 40% faster. It runs under six hours. And I know it kind of takes away a bit from all of this Hadoop work in the sense that it makes it seem less compelling, but so be it, right? Because uh, not everyone that uses two fishes operates at the scale and velocity at, uh, that Foursquare does. So uh, for a lot of them, for the foreseeable future, building indexes on a single machine is going to make sense. And you know what, for free, they just, it's 40% faster now, so that's great as well. Uh, the original goal was for us to be able to build a full index on our Hadoop cluster in under one hour. Uh, the spoiler is that we're not quite there yet. Uh, as of now, we produce a working index that is very close to the index produced by the single machine, but not quite identical yet. Uh, in about 90 minutes to two hours, depending on cluster load. Uh, but we haven't even started to scratch the surface of the kind of optimizations that you can do. So I think realistically we can get to under one hour uh, if we put a little more work into it. My estimate is that we're about 90% done. We, uh, we need to put a little more work into making the output near identical, uh, you know, fixing whatever bugs along the way that it takes and to actually start deploying these indexes to production. There are a few minor features and build options that we don't support yet. They're minor in that we don't need them to build the indexes that we serve at Foursquare. Maybe they matter to someone else, but I will get around to them, I promise. Uh, we'll spend a little more work making it faster. I mean, I've got my ego. I said I would make this thing run in under an hour, and I will do it, goddammit. Uh, and finally, we've got to integrate this with our Luigi workflows because it's kind of a joke. I use a make file uh, that I just run with make dash j, and it kind of works, uh, but it, it, it's not sustainable, really. Uh, and as a tribute to that little make file, here is a visualization of all the dependencies contained in it. So that's about 50, 
to 55, I forget exactly, 50 jobs or so that run uh, on the cluster. And it, it looks, I guess, intimidating and a little bit beautiful at the same time because, like I said, it's a very complex data pipeline that's, that's, been, that's been broken down into its smallest logical unit. So uh, that's everything I had. I encourage you to go to twofishes.net. Uh, I believe David had just released a new public index of, uh, for, of two fishes. And we are also in the process of uh, releasing a toy index using Getty's thesaurus of geonames. Uh, so, I guess we have a minute or two for questions. Do we? Yeah. The mm -hmm. Um, so Yahoo place names is, 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 it's a good thing that you brought it up. So you mean the where on earth, uh, and is that what you mean? Sorry? Did you mean Yahoo's where on earth? Yes. Okay. So we do, we do conflate GeoNames features with where on earth. That's been pre-computed. We don't simultaneously ingest from both. As for, uh, Getty's thesaurus of GeoNames, we've only just started like a few weeks back. David suggested it to me as a source. I think they're considering it within Twitter. I don't know. Uh, and we've, we've got it as a working proof of concept. The whole scalding build actually pulls in the uh, Getty thesaurus of geonames and it produces an index that works for forward geocoding at this point because we are unable to match any polygons right now because we don't understand TGN's ridiculously crazy ontology of place types. They've got everything from ancient Mesopotamian burial site to, I don't know, coffee shop, I guess. So it's, it's hard to match them back to to our ontology of places, but we'll get there. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay. Yes? How do you stack the address deduplication? I'm sorry? Any deduplication in your books, how do you tackle the duplicate data? A lot of deduplication actually happens at runtime uh, on the server side. So if, and this happens frequently, there are like admin threes and admin twos and cities all of the same name. They've just been kind of naively hard coded sometimes that okay, always prefer the city or if there's a neighborhood of the same name, prefer the neighborhood. So it's, it's not terribly sophisticated, but we do take care that uh, nearby features of similar names are excluded. But at the same time, the feature that we finally serve back to you will indicate what features were subsumed. Right? Yes. So these hot fixes. Yeah, so I was, one of the things I wanted to do was to be able to automatically invalidate hotfixes based on, you know, whether it conflicts with a change that comes in in the base data. To be honest, I, I haven't arrived at a policy for how that conflict resolution would work, but no, we don't do that right now. The way it works is that, and it, like I said, we also bake the same fix into the index. So uh, at some point, we should be able to retire the hotfix. That's how it works right now, but you can keep it on. Yeah, we do it only so that we can react really quickly to the change. And the long-term solution is usually to also fix it in the index. Right? Yes? Is there a place where you have all your regression test cases? Uh, no, not at the moment. But that's a good idea. I think we should. Right. I I'm told we're out of time. So thank you. Hey, uh,